before we go into details, I just share something about the industry that hopefully you will find it interesting. The key message I would like to say that financial planning is a growth industry. But looking at these statistics that was obtained about at the end of 2011, there are many, many wealthy persons around the world. Um, based on that survey report, more than 11 million people have their assets more than 1 million US dollars for investments. And the good thing is that all these wealthy people no longer concentrate into one area. Now we really spread around the whole world. They are eager to invest because they have the money to invest. And then they need the advice from the financial planners to help. But during the whole process of the investments, we see issues. Let me just call one very uh, recent example. We read from the newspapers saying that in US, just in US alone, the amount of the money put inside the US bond funds or bond ETF were more than US dollars 360 billion. Think about just in one year, US investors, and many of them are the retail investors, put more than 360 million US dollars into the bond funds and bond ETF. And think about it, we are now at such a low interest rate environment. And many of these bond funds invest into the high yield bonds. And we all know that in the industry, what does it mean by high yield bonds? So when the whole environment change in the not distant futures, we don't know when, but once when the market change, when these high yield bond funds value dropped, what will the investors say by that time? So in US, um, the newspapers talk about some actions done by the US regulators on this. And in Hong Kong, probably our Hong Kong um, colleagues can also share with you, we are very concerned about it. We issued a circular not long ago, just a few months ago, reminding all the financial planners in Hong Kong, be they independent financial planners or the banks, be very mindful about recommending these high yield bond funds to their clients. In particular, in some instances, I know that some of the bond funds guarantee a fixed payout every month, but they never tell the customers that in case if the bond fund can't make this interest income, this fixed payout in fact come from their principles. So no one, you know that no one read the small print, but this is the small prints are that important. So I hope I give you both the good side and the bad side. The good side is that there's a lot of wealth, a lot of money for the industry to make. The bad side is that there's a lot of challenges because of all this no interest rate environment, because the investors want to have the yield enhancements without recognizing about the risk. So you guys are very important in both um, providing the services to investors, but also uh, protecting the interests of the investors. So from the IOSCO side, probably in case if you do not know IOSCO, IOSCO stands for the International Organizations of the Securities Commissions. So this is a worldwide body of all the regulators around the world. We have now have more than 124 regulators as our official members. And your association is also one of our associate members. And we got all the others, um, stock exchanges, etc. also here. We, we are the responsible for setting the standards on the securities areas. Uh, we came up with quite a number of the standards, and that was the first one we issued dealing with the selling of the financial products. This one was issued back in um, 2011. This is the first initiative put out by the regulators on a global basis, setting out what is the minimum disclosure standards at the point of sales. I, I don't want to go into details about all this, because to you, this is some things that you know it well in from your heart. Um, but I, I, I set it up, I, why do I set it up here is because we found that although the regulators set out the minimum disclosure standards, the problem is that probably no one read it. Although we require all sorts of the information be disclosed to the investors, the first problem is probably the financial planners do not read it. Suppose the financial planners to read all the prospectuses, 
all the offering documents so that they'll be able to know all the product features in heart. But very honestly, based on our interaction with the industry, we find that in, in practice, many financial planners simply read the one page or two pages summary of the products before they jump out and recommend the products to their clients. So from the financial planner side, we find that industries probably are not paying enough attention to that. And from the investor side, probably worse. I mean, imagine who will read 100 pages of the prospectus? Who will, who will read through it and look at all the five pins to find out what are the real issues the investors need to look at? So although we set out the standards, we found that we can't rely on the investors themselves to read the prospectus, to make their own investment decisions. This won't work. So after that, we look for who should be held liable, who should be responsible for making sure that investors will make the right investment decisions. Then we look for, of course, the next one on the food chain would be the intermediaries, would be the distributors. Because generally, it is the distributors will recommend the products to the investors. So then we come up with our next project. We'll be on the suitabilities with respect of the distributions of the complex financial products to the investors. Because in practice, we know that all products are pushed to the clients, are sold or recommended by the distributors to the clients. So we believe from the regular perspective, the distributors should ensure that whatever products they recommend must be suitable to the clients. So um, this is probably a more than three years projects. We did uh, uh, come up with a consultation papers and then we invite industry to put their comment. And I must say also thank you to your association because no mate and also your Brazilian um, representative, I'm not sure you're sitting here, um, um, came up to our IOSCO meeting back in, I think it's April last year, and attend our uh, meeting with the uh, uh, financial stakeholders, giving us very helpful, um, insightful views from the industry viewpoint regarding our proposed regulations. So thank you very much for, for your input. And, and based on that, we come up with our conclusions and issue our consultation papers just not long ago, just in January this year. I just want to spend some time going through um, some of the key features of these uh, proposals. First one, ask you the questions. Look at the headings. Our headings is on complex financial products. I just want to ask you the questions. Why don't we use the term risky financial products? Is complex equivalent to high risk? Yes or no? Okay, good. I hear the answer is no. Um, in, in fact, when we develop our, our mandate, we debate about it. Should we look at risky air products or should we look at the hard complex products? But I guess the French regulators came out a, a, a papers, I guess about two years ago, make it very clear that uh, complex product doesn't mean it's a risky product. But from a regular perspective, why we pay particular attention to the complex product is because, because of the structures or the features of all these products, so complex, so opaque, so that the retail investors probably have no idea about the risk profiles uh, or the maximum downside risk of these products. That is something we as regulators are concerned about. We are not that concerned about risky products. Because honestly, when we look at some of them, like the stocks listed on your exchanges, some of these penny stocks, those in Hong Kong we call the fourth line or fifth line stocks, in fact, they are very risky. There's no trading, they're heavily manipulated. To me, they are, they are very risky. But the investors would be able to understand about the risk involved. They, if they buy it, they buy it with their eyes fully opened. So for us, we are not concerned about this. But for us, we are more concerned about those structured products, probably come with the name Bond or Bond similar. That would give um, the investors the sort of the mis 
understanding that this is a very safe product. But in practice, because of the uh, complexness and opaquenesses of the investment structures, there's no way you and I, I would say you and I, would be very easy to find out what would be the value of these structured products. And no way you and I would know that whether there will be a, a readily available secondary market so that when the retail investors want to sell it, they will always be a willing buyers to buy it. So the key message I want to look at is for us, the issue is on the complexness of the products. And at the end, we come up with nine major principles. Don't worry, I won't go over all the nine principles, but I will pick up a few principles and come up with a few points that would like to draw your particular attention. By the way, this is the, the report. It's about 30 pages, and about 10 pages are the appendices. So feel free, uh, if you're interested, come to iOSCO website and download it, look at it. This is something I, I believe would be quite helpful. And because this is international standards, all the regulators around the world are basically obliged to adopt this um, in the not distant futures. The first one, classification of the investors. There's nothing, nothing that probably you don't know. Basically, this standard say that um, the regulators need, or basically, regulators need to ask the industry to classify all the clients into retail and non-retail. So look at the principles. Nothing, nothing unusual. But you all know that the devil is always in the details. And in our, in our papers, underneath these principles, we set down a lot of the, we call the means of implementations. Those details that the regulators and the industry need to take note of. And in these particular principles, we draw, we'd like to draw one point to all of you. Don't classify your client into retail or non-retail based on something very simple. Like for example, simply not based on because it meets certain financial threshold, no matter how it's set. Or just because your customers come to tell you, I'm retail or I'm not retail. We are asking the industries that you need to take the initiative, you need to do your own soul searching work to find out whether these clients is really knowledgeable, understand about the risk behind, and, and of course have that wealth then, then you will be able to classify this client as a non-retail client. The underlying message why we need to do so is that in many jurisdictions and in many regular framework, in case if that client is classified as a non-retail investor, the financial planners are generally not obliged to ensure the recommendation is suitable to the client. So in order for, for that exemption to be available to the industries, we make it very clear that the industry don't simply do the, the simple steps by, 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 for example, classifying the client once when it meets certain monetary threshold. We ask the industry, you need to go through several steps. And for example, in particular, if you are dealing with some organizations like your local councils, your local county, municipalities, don't take for granted these people, these organizations must be non retail, must have the knowledge. Based on the latest Neiman Brother cases, we found a lot of these um, so called local government officials made investment decisions without knowing what, what they were doing. So, this is the first thing we would like to draw your attention. And the second thing is that once when you classify the, your client into retail or non retail, don't think this is one off requirement. In fact, this is an ongoing requirement because your relationship with, with a client is ongoing. So industries should ask for the information from the clients on an ongoing basis and then continuously to judge whether the client should be classified as a retail or non-retail. Once when you have classified the client into retail and non-retail, then come to the second principles. It's about your obligations your duties to the clients. There's a lot of words there, I don't want to read it out. But in simple terms, it's whether you put your client first. It's all about your fiduciary duties to your clients. And, and in particular, I just want to bring up one particular issue I want to share with you. Out of all these obligations, we expect the financial planners 
must do in order to fulfill the obligation of the clients. Just want to talk about one point. It's about the conflicts of interest. No matter whether this is a perceived or obvious conflict of interest. Say, for example, if this is a principle to principle transactions, to us, the, conf the potential conflict of interest would be much, much higher. And secondly, if the, if the distributors is also the issuer of the same products, then the obvious conflict of interest would be much higher. So um, the industries have been asked to address and deal with this conflict of interest issues in particular. We have not banned anything. We just ask the industry try to identify and mitigate and also disclose the potential conflict of interest to the clients. And the third principle is about um, the disclosures of the information to the clients. And, and the disclosure of information, of course, cover all those things you know, like the features, the basic features, what would be the, the, the reward, what would be the risk, what would be the causes, what would be the fair value. These are sort of the information we expect the financial planner would disclose to the investors. But one particular point we raise in this paragraph is say that, how about in case if your investors is not knowledgeable enough, doesn't know what is written on the prospectus, what to do? This is a, a real, real issue. In past, or even at present, many of the regular framework rests on the principles that Buyer be aware. Now I'm challenging all of you. It is the golden principle we should hold on forever. It's always buyer be aware. Carefully enter. I'm not the first one saying this. In fact, for those colleagues come from Europe or from UK, um, the new CEO of the FCA, the new body, the Financial Conduct Authority bodies, just uh, point out this in his maiden speech in 1st of April, raising these issues. In case if your client is not knowledgeable enough in understanding about the risk reward profile, should you still continue to push these complex high risk products to these clients that don't understand, don't know? So this is an issue, we raise it and probably uh, more discussions, more research, more work need to be done in this way. And the fourth thing, the fourth principle, I really would like everyone to take note on that one. This is a very important principle. The fourth one say that in case the client come to you, say, I would like to buy a particular product, should you sell it to that, pro to the, that client? I.e., this is a non-solicitation or pure execution mode, no matter how you call it. Should you or should not? MIFID in Europe, MIFID requires you to ensure that the product is appropriate. Um, in other parts of the world, probably we don't have something similar. So in this principle, we put down a very important pointer here, saying that in case if you know that the investors is not urgent enough, doesn't know about the risk profile of these products, but still come to tell you that I would like to buy this product because, because my friend, my dear friend bought it yesterday and he said it's good. Or because someone made money last month, so I want to follow um, the trend. Should you, as the product issuer, continue to sell the product to that client? And what we put down is that, sorry, guy, as a, as a creditable, financial planner, you need first assess the client's knowledge. You need to know whether this is the one um, really suitable to that client or not. If not, what we say that um, you need to consider whether to prohibit the execution only mode, i.e. you need to make the choice to see whether if this is so unsuitable to the client, you need to turn down this business. I know that would be hard for the industry because your business depends on how much product you sell to client. 
But we raise this point, if you really believe that this is not suitable time, whether or not you should turn it down. And if you decide um, you shouldn't turn it down, you should continue to sell the product to the client. Then we require that you need to warn the client. You need to warn the client this is not suitable. And you need to disclose all sorts of the downside risk to the client so that the clients can really understand at least you have warned it, you have told them all the problems, but they still insist because my, my good friends bought it, so I still want to jump in, I still want to buy it. Then he knows all these um, downside risk. So this is the, um, the key point we pointed out in the principle number four. And the principle number five is about the assessment. It's all about, we, we ask the industry, before you, you, you finally decide to sell the product, you need to go through a process of the assessment. And the uh, process assessment on both, both the client assessment and product assessment. On the client's assessment, is something simple, KYC. Of course, KYC means that you need to know the client's objectives, the principles, their risk tolerance, their investment horizons, all these things. That probably is something that all the financial planners know very well and doing well. What probably we are concerned is on the other side, is on the product due diligence. So I just want to read out a few uh, steps we expect the financial planners to do. Remember I told you the story before, we found that many financial planners sell products, they have not really done sufficient product due diligence. They just probably read the one or two pages of the, um, of, of the pitch book, and then they go out, go out to, to sell the products. So what we say that um, underneath this principle, under item five, we say the intermediaries should perform the following analysis. First one, how the complex products are structured and priced. Two, the nature and complexity of the product's payoff and the underlying components. Third, the relevant level of the risk, that including both the counterparty risk, liquidity risk, and the market risk. And more importantly, people miss it always. It's about the experience and the reputation of the product issuers who issue it. Fees, charges, and all the causes involved in, the, in, in, in that products. And also, very importantly, the level of liquidity, whether there is a liquid secondary market, so that when your client wants to sell it back, they were able to do so. Lock-in period. Many structured products have a long lock-in period. Then you need to disclose about the lock-in period to the clients. Or in some instances, if there is a cooling-off period, then you have to tell the client, within that cooling off period, you will be able to rescind from the contract. And more importantly, many prospectus or the briefing paper just tell the, um, the investors about the likely scenario. That means the, 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 sort of the best scenarios. We now ask the issuers must tell about those abnormal, under stress scenarios so that the financial planners can understand under this sort of the stress levels, how would the product perform? What would be the value, potential value at that point of time? And more importantly, finally, this is the final. It's the nature of guarantees. We saw cases saying that this is a guaranteed product. Big, that was a guaranteed product. But the small print would put down all sorts of the caveat. Say up to whatever limit, under what circum particular um, um, circumstances, then the guarantee will kick in. So we ask, as a, as a financial planner, when you read all these perspectives, you need to fully understand about all these features. So, uh, probably not a good news. That means a lot of additional work that the financial planners need to do. But we believe these are very important steps that, that the financial planners need to do in order to understand the issues. Then the next one, the, the principle six, is about the provision of the sufficient information. Um, what we say is that generally when, when, when the financial planners deal with the clients, 
the clients do not tell you the full stories. You know that. Um, in, in many jurisdictions, this is our culture. I know that when I talk to my financial planners, I won't tell him the, the full pictures. I don't tell him how much money I have. I will. So the financial planners, in the worst cases, probably don't tell you anything. Go away. Just tell me which is the best product. Um, so we, we know that, and, and, and in this principle, we say that, the, of course, the clients need to po provide all the information to the financial planners. But it is equally the financial planners to be, to be diligent, to ask all these relevant questions. And at the end of the day, if the client does not provide full information, then we see there's a limitation. But you need to warn the client, we could be able to provide you the best advice based on the limited information you have given to us. So these are the, the essence of that principle six. And for the sake of the time, I don't want to go through the, the, the principle seven, eight, nine, because they're all about the basic uh, compliance function, um, incentive functions, uh, enforcement, or maybe for the incentive. Just want to raise one point. Um, that incentive principle basically asks that the financial planners need to reveal the whole investment arra uh, in incentive arrangement so that the staff, the fund line staff, will not be pushed to sell certain products just because it will be able to get the highest amount of the rebate or the commissions. In fact, I just want to quote one, one recent research report that published by PwC. The, that report um, looked at the, the private banking and financial planning um, sectors and came up with one message that many firms now would put the compliance element into one of the key factors in determining the compensation elements of the fund line staff. And I read from the newspapers, for example, like in Hong Kong, the HSBC, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, has also recently announced that their fund line staff will no longer be purely remunerated by based on the amount of the products they sold. A lot of the um, elements, like how they deal with the kind complaint, the surface levels, um, the compliance with the rules and regulations, will be the, the factors considered um, in, the, in the final incentive given to the fund line staff. Okay, probably um, I don't have much more time, so I just want to go into the last part. This is some of my personal thought about the challenges you are facing. This is the, the diagram I usually like to use to describe about the financial planning sectors. In the financial planning sectors, I, use, I love to use the word three Ps. Products, practices, and people are the key elements in, the, in, the, in, the, in these sectors. So what does it mean? People are generally divided into two parts the investors and the financial planners. For the investors, probably you, you take a look about some of the earlier message. We are, we are very concerned that many investors actually are not knowledgeable. They don't know many products. They will not be able to make their investment decisions themselves. Worse is that many of these investors simply act based on certain emotional event Oh, because my, my, my friend invests in it. Oh, this is too good to be true. I don't want to miss opportunity. This is the last time I become the millionaire, so jump in. Or in many cases, when we look at it, the behavior is that the investors say that if, I, if the investment make money, it's because I got a good far side. This is all because of my judgment. But in case if the investment turn out bad, this must be my advisor's fault. My advisors give me the bad investments. So there's a lot of the behavior that causing investors um, to make these sometimes irrational investment decisions. So that means the burden will be put on the advisors, on the financial planners. You are the guys making sure that you are providing the best advice to the clients and making sure that um, these investments are suitable to their clients based on their particular circumstances. So we all count on the professionalism and the integrity of the financial planning sectors 
in protecting the interests of the investors. Sometimes we also note that you provide a lot of the products to the client at the request by the clients because the client comes to see you, I want to buy this. So you have to go around, try to source these products for the clients. But what we say is that, hey, we should like sit down, think through carefully. Not just because your clients ask for these products. If you believe that this is not suitable, should you just go around and source these products for that client? We ask you to think through this. And as the footnote I put down there, this is also not just my personal thought. The UK FCA have just issued a new concept paper. The very strange name, now they call it occasional paper number one. This is, they say, how do you apply the behavioral economics to all these issues we just uh, mentioned. So suggest also take a look and, and read these products. This is um, a, a sort of, to me, a watershed step saying that the regulators slowly branch out from the buyer be aware, caviar mTOR stage into really understanding whether the industry are providing the best advice to the clients are doing the well. If not, then whether the regulators should step in. So the next one is about the product. Product probably have two, two comments I want to mention. It's, as we keep on saying, no one read the full prospectus. And very difficult for the investors to compare one product versus to, to the others. So throughout the whole world, in Europe, you got, um, I think it's a key requirement for the unit trust. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have something similar. We are, the, the whole trend is to us, since no one read it, how come we have one or two or three pages, very simple um, sales document that set out all the key features so hopefully, one, the investor will read it, and two, they will be able to compare one product to the others in a very organized way. So this is something the regulators are working hard on that, although the outcome, um, the end result is still not yet fully acceptable at this point of time. The second, again, this is the second point is also asked in that UK FCA papers. Shouldn't be certain products be sold on a particular channel? or certain some products be only sold with some particular type of the clients. I put down the examples. Whether some products could only be sold on the exchanges rather than the OTC basis. What sort of products? In my mind, would be some very illiquid product. For example, in Australia, they went into this trouble 20 years ago about their property fund, about the real, invest, real estate investment fund. We all know that real, ad, real estate investment fund invests into properties, no matter it's commercial properties or shopping malls. Totally illiquid. If all the investors want to have a redemption when the market is bad, how can you sell the products? How can you raise the monies? So that was a big trouble in Australia more than 20 years ago. So that's why in Hong Kong, when we first approved our real and investment funds, we make it clear that fund must be listed on exchanges so that when the investors want to, to have a, a exit, they can sell it to another willing buyers on the exchange. So I just want to quote one example. Um, on other type of the investors, probably you can imagine whether some of these products more suitable for the, we call professional investors or sophisticated investors or accredited investors. For example, in US, most of the structured products can only be sold to those clients open an option account with the brokers because the hurdle of opening option account will be much, much higher than just open a normal brokerage account. So this is some thought uh, probably the industry can think about. And come to the final, um, second final point, because I know that we are hungry, we want to have a lunch now. Um, on the practice side, still a lot of the issues we, we need to deal with. I covered about the conflict of interest earlier on. I talked about uh, the compensation I just want to bring your attention. The world has changed. Although many parts of the world still rely on the rebate from the issuers. But I guess in, in UK have now moved to uh, without commission rebate models effective early this year. Australia, probably the next one in the world, will follow suit in the middle of this year. So the challenge for all the financial planners in UK and Australia is that whether it would be 
an easy, smooth transition from a commission rebate model to a transaction commission models or on an account management um, fee basis models. To me, this is something yet to be seen, but uh, that would be a, a, a challenge to other regulators, to other industry in other parts of the world. Suitability, probably I don't need to go over in the details. Final point, technology. As a regulators, we keep on saying that our regulations are technology neutral, i.e. no matter you, you, you recommend a product to the client on a face-to-face -face basis, or on a telephone, or by email, or by a flyer, by mail job, we say that all our requirements are, are the same. But really, unfortunately, the latest technology really get us uh, a bit off cut. Think about in, in, in US, um, the social media, the Twitter, the Facebooks. How many of the product issuers are using this medium to push the products? To recommend the products on the mobile phone. Easy, easy for you to read all these banners on the mobile phone. But generally, the regulators require if there's a promotion of the products, there must be some minimum risk disclosure, risk warning. But it's a mobile phone, it's a three inches uh, iPhone. Um, the banner is that small, how can you put a risk warning in such a banner? So it's a challenge. As regulators, um, we are working on it. We are looking at these issues about the technology, how the technology change will affect how the industry promote the products to the investors, how all these basic um, uh, protection issues can be resolved. So, um, I just so Rami, uh, we are working on it, and in due course, we will also would like to seek the input from the industry, in particular your dear association. Finally, this is my concluding part. Um, as I said, the regulations have been set. The regulation is set for compliance by the industry. So when the re international regulators try to come up with this regulation, we appreciate very much about the input from the from the industry. So that concludes my little presentation, and I'll take up all your time. Thanks. <laughs>